Okay, so last time we started talking about context-free grammars, and in particular we started talking about Chomsky normal form. Okay, so we're going to do a, a quick review today of context-free grammars and Chomsky normal form, and then we're going to actually go through the process of starting to write a program that can read a grammar from a text file with the eventual goal of having, the, uh, having a program that can convert an arbitrary grammar, an arbitrary context-free grammar, into Chomsky normal form. Okay? So we're going to start off today by just reading a file from disk, reading a text file that represents a context-free grammar into disk, or from disk into, into a program. That's probably as far as we're going to make it today, but the eventual goal is going to be to have you guys write a program that actually does the conversion from an arbitrary context-free grammar into a grammar in Chomsky normal form. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. All right, so we're going to start off with the theory, and then we'll move fairly sh shortly into the code. Okay. Uh, Following along, uh, if you want to, the slides that I'm using are online uh, at this URL. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. I'll post it to Piazza. Uh, I'll post the, the URL to Piazza. Um, it is slides from a textbook on the theory of computation by Goddard at Clemson. So if you search for Clemson, Goddard, theory of computation, Chomsky normal form, you should get these slides. Um, we'll also be using... Uh, some lecture notes uh, from another course uh, by Dave Bacon, uh, Introduction to Formal Methods in Computer Science, Chomsky Normal Form. So if you search for that, you should be able to find that as well. And this is the URL. We're also going to be looking at Wikipedia, which has a pretty good definition of Chomsky Normal Form. And in fact, oh, no, it's not this one. Some of the, some of the linguistics articles actually have a note at the top of the Wikipedia page that says that they are too technical and uh, asking editors to make them more accessible to a broader audience, which we will not be doing. Um, all right, so let's start off with the formal definition of a context-free grammar. So if you read some of the early Chomsky papers as well as pretty much any theory of computation or formal language theory textbook, you're going to find this definition for a context-free grammar. So it's going to be defined by a tuple, and the tuple is going to have four elements in it. The first element is going to be a non-terminal vocabulary. So this is going to be a finite set where every element in the set is a non-terminal. Okay? So a non-terminal is going to be something that can occur on the left-hand side of a context-free rule. It could potentially also appear on the right-hand side of a context-free rule, but it's the only thing that can appear on the left-hand side of a context-free rule. Okay? And then we're going to have some set. Okay? So this means that we're going to have non, no repeating elements because it is a set. Okay? So a common example of a, one of these categories, one of these non-terminal categories in a constituency grammar might be a noun or a verb or a verb phrase, or a sentence. All of these are examples of constituent elements that would commonly be associated with a non-terminal category in a context-free grammar. That makes sense? Okay. All right. Sigma is the second element of the tuple, and this is going to be a finite set of terminals. Okay. The set of terminals is disjoint from the set of non-terminals, which just means that they are different. There's no elements in common. Something is either a terminal or it's a non-terminal. It's not going to be a member of both. Okay, so the set of terminals are going to be the tokens of the language, okay? Or rather, the, any, anything that could be a token in the language. So the words in a language would commonly be the terminal elements in a context-free grammar. Okay? You could ostensibly construct a context-free grammar consisting of something other than words. For example, if you were trying to model the internal syntax within a word in 
morphosyntactic terms, then you might have morphemes as the terminals rather than words. Uh, but in the vast majority of cases, the terminals are going to be the words in the language, okay? at least when we're dealing with a language like English. Okay, so we've got a set of non-terminals, and we've got a set of terminals. Terminals are also going to appear in context-free rules, but they can only appear on the right-hand side of a context-free rule. Okay, and we'll get to what a context-free rule looks like in a moment. R is going to be a finite relation from V to the union of V with sigma star, where the star represents the clean star operation. What does this mean? Well, it is a relation rather than a function. That's the first thing to notice. This is going to mean that the same non-terminal could potentially appear on the left-hand side of more than one rule. Okay? If R were a function, then a non-terminal could only appear on the left-hand side of one rule because it would be mapping to a single right-hand side. That, in fact, is not the case. You could have a noun phrase goes to a noun, or you could have a noun phrase goes to a determiner noun, or you could have a noun phrase goes to a determiner adjective noun. And those could all be valid rules within the same grammar. Okay. Because of that, R is a relation rather than, rather than a function. Okay. So, R is going to be a set of rules. We'll look at what the rules look like in a moment. And finally, we have S. So S is going to be the start symbol. It is going to be one of the elements in the non-terminal vocabulary. So the start symbol is also a non-terminal. And it is going to be, in particular, the non-terminal that is going to be at the root of any constituency trees, any syntax trees that result from parsing using this grammar. Okay? All right. Okay. So what does one of these rules look like? Any guesses? You've probably already seen rules of this format. Yes? Exactly. All right. So let's look at, let's pull up a created new text document and create an example of a rule. So an NP goes to, well, why did that, that didn't work. We can use the actual arrow. So an NP goes to a determiner noun. That would be an example of a context-free rule. Okay, so it's a rewrite rule. This is going to be called the left-hand side. So for the obvious reason that it is on the left-hand side of the arrow, the arrow breaks the rule up into a left-hand side and a right-hand side. On the left-hand side of a context-free rule, we are going to have exactly one non-terminal element. It would not be a valid context-free rule if there were zero elements on the left-hand side. It would not be a valid context-free rule if there were a terminal on the left-hand side. It would not be a valid context-free rule if there was more than one element of any kind on the left-hand side of the rule. There is going to be exactly one element. Next, we're going to have the arrow. And that's just the conventional way of drawing it, the conventional way of writing it. The arrow itself, there isn't anything magical or special about that. That's just the convention that's used to delineate the left-hand side from the right-hand side. 
If we were going to represent this in a file, for example, we wouldn't necessarily have the arrow in the file. We might or we might not. Finally, to the right of the arrow is the right-hand side. The right-hand side is going to consist of zero or more elements from the union of V and sigma. So V is the non-terminal vocabulary. Sigma is the terminal vocabulary. So the union of those is going to be all of the symbols. The union of the terminal and vocabulary the terminal vocabulary with the non-terminal vocabulary will just be the set of all of the terminal and non-terminal symbols. And the star here is the clean star as used in regular expressions, which means zero or more. So we're going to have zero or a sequence of zero or more symbols from the terminal and non-terminal vocabularies. Any questions about that? Yes? If we want the grammar to be in Chomsky normal form, which we eventually will, then it must be of a certain form. But in general, a context-free grammar does not have to be in normal form. So if it is not in normal form, then it could have zero or more symbols on the right-hand side, and that's what we're talking about right now. We will eventually restrict that further once we start talking about normal forms. Okay? Okay. So, for example, this is a rule. It happens to be that this rule does conform with Chomsky normal form, but we could have a rule that looks like this. So DT, so an, a noun phrase can be rewritten as a determiner followed by an adjective followed by a noun. That is a perfectly valid context-free rule. Okay. What are some other examples of context-free rules? Uh, a sentence consists of a noun phrase, and a verb phrase. That's another example of a context-free rule. Determiner goes to the. That's a context-free rule. You could also have context-free rules that mix terminals and non-terminals. Again, in Chomsky normal form, this won't be allowed, but in the general form, it is. So we could have a uh, a rule that looks like uh, noun phrase goes to the boys, the JJ boys. Okay? So the JJ boys, so JJ represents the non terminal category for adjective, so the something boys. This would be perfectly acceptable. And this is, for our purposes, probably not going to happen. But in general, this is useful to know. The non-terminals don't have to be linguistically motivated. Okay? Usually, in our context, they will be. But they don't have to be. Okay? So, for example, in machine translation, there is a paradigm uh, called hierarchical syntactic translation, hierarchical phrase-based machine translation. And those are going to use synchronous context-free rules that have two right-hand sides, so that, which isn't important for our purposes. But in those examples, they have non-terminal categories that are just wildcards. So you might end up with something that looks like this. Uh, That would be a perfectly valid context-free rule. A noun phrase, or yeah, uh, let's even 
Y goes to the X period. Does that make a lot of sense linguistically? Not so much. Let's make it even make let's make one that even makes less sense. Okay, how about that? Y goes to the x1 comma and x2. Probably not a linguistic constituent. Might happen to be if we're lucky. That's totally okay. Context-free rules don't necessarily have to correspond with linguistic constituents. If we're dealing with linguistics, then they usually will be, and it would make sense for them to be. But they don't have to be. Okay. And we could go further than that. The symbols don't even have to be characters. We could use emoji for the non-terminals if we wanted to. We could use whatever we want. Conceptually, these are arbitrary symbols. And if we were representing a context-free grammar in some domain other than linguistics, it's conceivable that it might make sense to have something else. Okay? For example, I don't know that context-free rules are used in genomics, but it wouldn't surprise me if they are. So looking at sequences of gene sequences, you could conceivably try to model that using a context-free grammar. I'm not an expert in that area, so I don't know if that's a smart idea or not, but you could attempt to model things other than language. Okay? Although you would be using the tools of language because we're talking about a grammar. Okay. Good so far? Okay. All right. So here we've got examples of rules in a context-free grammar. Okay. That grammar can be formally defined in, this, in terms of this four-tuple. In practice, if we have the set of rules, the other three things are implicit in the set of rules. So if you've got a set of rules, you can iterate over all of the rules and gather up the non-terminals and gather up the terminals. So if you have a set of rules, you can gather up the other things if you need to. The one thing you do need to know, though, is the start symbol. So you, we, it's going to be important to know what the start symbol is. Why is it going to be important to know what the start symbol is? Because if we don't know what the start symbol is, we won't know when we are done with a parse whether we have a string that is in the language or not. Okay? We won't know if it constitutes a complete sentence in the language. Okay? All right. Good so far? All right. So now let's switch over to Chomsky normal form. There are other normal forms. There's Grybach normal form. There's, I think, a couple of others. But Chomsky normal form is one of the big ones. Grybach normal form is the other big one that I know of. You could conceivably come up with your own normal form. The normal form just says there is a specified format that rules are bound to obey. Okay? And if they obey that format, then they are in the norm, then the set is in the normal form. Okay. All right. And again, these slides are from Goddard. Uh, right. So Chomsky normal form first of all, requires that you have a grammar. So the grammar must start off with being in the format that all grammars have. So it has to have a set of non-terminals, it has to set, have a set of terminals, it has to have rules, and it has to have a start symbol that is a member of the non-terminal set. Okay? All right. We haven't talked about epsilon yet. Recall that I said that on the right-hand side, you could have zero or more symbols. Okay? Let's look at a rule that has zero symbols. That's a rule with zero symbols on the right-hand side. 
a noun phrase goes to nothing. That's not really a sensible rule in a grammar that's talking about language, human language. What about this one, though? JJ goes to nothing. Does that, seem, or does that seem at least a little more sensible than having noun goes to nothing? Okay. Now, most linguists probably wouldn't posit an empty adjective category, but it doesn't, it, it's not complete nonsense to think about that, because then you could do something like this and have noun phrase goes to determine or adjective noun, and you don't have to have a separate rule that says noun phrase goes to determine or noun. If an adjective could be empty, then you could get a you, you could cover this case with this case in conjunction with this rule, okay? So it is conceivable that you could write a grammar that included rules with an empty right-hand side for well-motivated, sensible reasons, okay? You could probably get by just fine without those type of rules, but there might be situations where you find yourself wanting to use an empty rule on the right-hand side. And in general, in a context for grammar, that is allowed, that is legal. Now, conventionally, sometimes that will, be re that will be written rather than an empty side with epsilon, with the Greek letter epsilon, okay? But if you write it that way, you just have to be careful to make sure that it is clear that epsilon is not a non that epsilon is not a terminal that it's just a symbol used conventionally to represent nothing okay all right now this gets us back to chomsky normal form so in chomsky in order for a grammar to be in chomsky normal form all of the rules must be in one of three types. One type is A goes to B, C. So we allow any rule of the form non-terminal goes to non-terminal, non-terminal. So we allow rules where there is a non-terminal on the left-hand side and two non-terminals on the right-hand side. Exactly two non-terminals. Okay. We also allow, in Chomsky normal form, rules of the form A goes to C, where A is any non-terminal and C is any terminal. So we allow rules of the form term or sorry of the form non-terminal goes to terminal, where there is a single non-terminal on the left-hand side and a single terminal on the right-hand side. Rules of the first form are sometimes called binary branching rules, for the obvious reason that they have two elements on the right-hand side. The fact that there are two things makes it binary. Not the fact that there are that there are non-terminals. Rules of this form are called unary because there is a single branch if you were to write this in a tree form. Okay? So this is a sing this is a unary terminal production. This is a binary non-terminal production. Okay. If the language allows for epsilons somewhere, if, if your language has an epsilon anywhere in it, 
then the language contains epsilon. If the language contains epsilon, Chomsky normal form allows rules of the form s goes to epsilon, or s goes to nothing, only when s is the, is the start symbol. Okay. So if s is the start symbol, then Chomsky normal form allows for rules of the form s goes to nothing. Why would that be allowed in Chomsky normal form? Well, it's possible that you have a languages that contain the empty string. Okay, so it, it's possible that you want your language to allow to be to allow a legal parse for the empty string. Nothing's there. That would just be s goes to nothing, and that would be considered a legal string in the language. S goes to the empty string. The only way to handle that is to allow for the start symbol itself to go to epsilon, to go to nothing. Okay? But we're not going to allow epsilon to appear anywhere else. So if the grammar is in Chomsky normal form, the only place that epsilon can be is with, in a rule with the start symbol. We can have start symbol goes to nothing, but we can't have any other rules that go to nothing. Okay? All right. That's what Chomsky normal form is going to look like. There are good reasons why it's often useful to have a grammar in Chomsky normal form. One of the most important reasons is going to be that there exists an efficient algorithm for taking a string and a grammar and determining whether that string can be produced using that grammar and pr producing the parse tree that is associated with that if it is in the language. Okay? We're going to be looking at that algorithm or one, of, one such algorithm to do so after we talk about Chomsky normal form, but this should help motivate why. So if we've got a string that's n tokens long, here it says letters, I'm just going to say tokens. So if we've got a sentence that's n words long, then we know that we can derive that string from the grammar using 2n minus 1 steps. And this comes from the fact that all of the rules that involve non-terminals on the right-hand side are binary branching, and all of the rules that involve terminals are unary branching. Okay? All right. So the, main, the, the steps to follow to convert a grammar that is not in Chomsky normal form to a grammar that is in Chomsky normal form are going to consist of four main parts. Okay? The way I envision the program that you will be writing to be structured is going to be following along these steps. So I am envisioning that the program that you will eventually be writing will have a function that takes a grammar and returns a new grammar that where the resulting grammar is guaranteed to have no epsilon productions. Okay? And then the next function would be you, you take a grammar and then you return a new grammar where it's guaranteed that the second condition is true. And then a third function where the third condition is met and the fourth where the fourth condition is met. If that turns out not to work, we'll restructure it, but just as an FYI, that's the way I'm envisioning this will work. Okay. All right. Step two says get rid of all productions where the right hand side is one variable. Okay. Note it didn't say one symbol, it said one variable. And by variable, it means non-terminal. So we want to remove any unary branching 
rules where the right-hand side is a non-terminal. So that would be something like NP goes NP goes to N. That would be an example of a unary branching rule with a non-terminal on the right-hand side. Now this is a perfectly sensible rule. I mean, you can have, I mean, in fact, you can have a, no, a noun phrase that consists only of a bare noun. That's perfectly reasonable. But if we want to get the grammar into Chomsky normal form, we can't allow this. Okay? And so there are going to be steps that we can go through to get rid of rules of this form. Okay? All right. Next, we're going to replace every production that is too long by shorter productions. Okay? That would mean getting rid of rules like this that have more than two elements on the right-hand side. Or rules like this that have more than two elements on the right-hand side. Okay? How, I, how might we do that? Well, at this point, we would probably want to introduce new non-terminal categories. So if we want to replace this, we could equivalently say, well, we'll leave the first thing, and then we'll create a new non-terminal that encapsulates those two elements. Okay? So we could rewrite this as... Noun phrase goes to determiner x1, x1 goes to jjn. Okay? So here x1 is just a new dummy category that we have introduced to prevent the grammar to prevent the grammar from having this rule with three things on the right hand side. Okay? Now, because x1 will eventually be rewritten as jjnn these are going to have the same effect in terms of the strings that can ultimately be produced. The tree structure will look a little different. In the original tree, we would have a tree with, th with an element and three children directly underneath it. Here, we've got that same element has only two things underneath it, and then that second child itself is going to have two children. Okay? So the trees are going to look different, but the ultimate resulting string is going to be the same. Okay? And then the fourth move, the, the fourth thing that we're going to have to do is to find all places where a terminal occurs and make sure that those only the terminals only occur as the right hand as the single element right hand side of a rule okay in other words if we had rules that looked like this or this we would have to do something about it okay so let's first let's let's start with this rule and first do the thing that we did up here. So we're going to rewrite it so it's binary branching only. Okay. So how do we do that? We say noun phrase goes to the x2, x2 goes to jj boys. Okay. So that gets, that makes it so that this rule that had three things on the right-hand side now only has two things each. Okay? That was to take care of step three. So that happened in step three. Now we're in step four, and we've got a non or we've got a terminal on the right-hand side, but it's not the only thing there. This is not allowed. Okay? So to fix this we're going to do the same sort of thing by introducing new non-terminal categories. Okay, So we'll have here, so now we'll say x3 and create a new rule that is 
x3 goes to the, and x4 goes to boys. Okay? So these four rules together are going to be equivalent to this original rule. Okay? x3 was the, x2 is jj x4, and x4 is boys. So together, that's going to be equivalent to this. The tree is going to look different, but the ultimate resulting string will be the same. Okay? All right. Good so far? Um, let's take one quick look back at the epsilon production. If we had, let's say we had a rule that was jj goes to nothing, okay, and we wanted to get rid of that, we would have had to have gone through and anywhere where we found jj on the right hand side, we would have had to created a new variant of that rule in which JJ is removed. Okay, so for example, we would have had to introduce a new rule that looked like this. Okay, this one still stays the same, that still stays there, but we make a new variant where JJ is empty and that's what that would look like here. Okay? And similarly, up here, we would have had to have created a new version like this, where dt nn to take this in. Okay? All right. Okay. Ready to switch over to coding this up? Okay, so we're going to start by just writing a program that can read a grammar from disk. Okay, eventually we will transform that to do more so that the code after it reads it from disk will convert it to Chomsky normal form. Okay, so to do this I'm going to use a language that I'm familiar with that is in the book, the Seven Languages in Seven Weeks book. It's Scala. And I'd like you guys to read the Scala chapter. Okay? I don't expect you to know it at this point, and I'm not necessarily going to ask you to code in it, but I do want you to observe and think about coding in that language a little bit. Okay? I'm expecting that you'll do your coding in Python. I'm choosing to do this in Scala because there's some language constructs that Scala has that fit very nicely with some of the things that I'm going to want to do. You can do this, you can eventually get to the same goal without those constructs, and if you program in Python, you probably will, but it's going to be a useful exercise for you to see and think through those constructs. I'm currently working with uh, the system administrators to get Scala installed on the server that we use so that you'll have access to it if you want to. Uh, but frankly, probably the best way to experience Scala is actually in an IDE. So in Python, IDEs aren't nearly as important. Um, and in Scala, you can certainly program using just a text editor and the compiler. Uh, Scala is a compiled language. It runs on the Java Virtual Machine. Uh, it can be run in interpreted mode at the command line, just like you would run a Python script. You can run a Scala script. That's not the normal way of doing things, though. Um, I'm going to show you programming inside Eclipse. So this is the Scala IDE, which is Eclipse, which is originally designed for Java with a Scala mode running, okay? 
If you want information about the language, search for Scala, and it will be the first hit. Should be, okay? Scala is a multi-paradigm language, okay? We've talked about object-oriented programming. We have not talked about functional programming. We hopefully will talk more about functional programming, and we will see a little bit of functional style in my Scala code. Uh, but Scala allows you to do either, either, either type, okay? which is kind of nice. Uh, Scala is also statically typed, which I really like, and the author of the Seven Languages in Seven Weeks book does not. Okay, so that's a matter of taste. Um, if you search for Scala IDE and want to try it, you'll find the development environment that I'm using. You can download that IDE. Uh, it should be available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, and it is not a small download, but it's not gigantic either. Um, and if you do that, then you can work within the environment, and there's some uh, benefits for doing so. Okay. So within the Scala environment, you're, or within the IDE, it's going to ask you for a workspace, which is just a folder where you want your work to live. And then I'm going to create a new Scala project. Uh, I'm going to call it Grammar. Okay. All right. And there's a source folder. I know this is a little hard to read. Once I get the text up, I'll try to increase the font size to make it easier to easier to uh, easier to see. So I'm going to create a new Scala class. And what do you want to call this? Grammar? CNF? Doesn't matter. Scala is a little bit more permissive than, than Java is. So Scala runs on the Java virtual machine. You may or may not be familiar with the Java programming language. If you are familiar with the Java programming language, the nice thing is, from that perspective, that Scala is interoperable with Java. So if you have existing Java code, it can interoperate with Scala code. Scala is also going to make use of some Java objects and classes like the string class. Scala makes use of the Java string class uh, and inherits some of the ideas around the Java uh, way of thinking like packages. Okay? Um, but where Java classes require one class per file, Scala does not. Okay, so I'll just call it mygrammar.scala. Okay, and notice that by default it created a mygrammar package. Okay, which means that there's actually a folder called my grammar there. If we don't want to worry about that, we can tell it to move it outside of that package and put it use the default package, which is in general bad practice in the Java world, but we're going to live with that. And this should not be called scala.scala. We'll call it my grammar.scala. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to start with copying some code that I set up earlier. Start with a hello world. One thing that you will immediately notice from Scala, coming from Python, is that there's more, more going on. There's going to be more syntax of the language. There's uh, a little bit more to do to get a pro program set up. So let me see if I can get the font increased for us.
Oh, come on. Of the font. Let's go with 24 point. Okay. So I should have thought of this before. Um, there's another way of doing this. Yeah, there you go. 